Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We had a good break, pretty, uh, pretty brief. Um, but we're going to be introducing our final speaker of the day, uh, Divya Passar. So Divya is a planetary scientist and is currently calling us all the way from America. Divya is currently pursuing a PhD in space and climate physics at UCL's Mullard Space Science Laboratory, where she's developing methods of 3D image processing, visualization and analysis for Martian and Saturnian icy satellites. Divya is also a postdoctoral scholar at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where she is supporting the Europa Clipper and Europa Lander mission concepts. As well as this, Divya is an award-winning poet, speaker and composer. For more information, uh, you can visit her website. It's definitely very inspiring. Just um, search Divya Empassade. And thanks for joining us today at this very early hour. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Um, and thank you to the previous speakers whose talks were, were amazing. Um, sorry? Oh, I think we're good. I think someone had their mic on. Go for oh, it. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll share my screen. Um, just one moment, it's freezing a little bit. And hopefully you see that okay? That's Brill, thanks. Awesome. Um, well, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, how we use 3D to look at the solar system. And I'm also gonna just show you a lot of cool videos. Um, uh, so just to start out, um, because um, a lot of the work that I do is very interdisciplinary, I just wanted to emphasize, um, I'm not really gonna talk too much about my career, but um, the pathways to doing space science are um, are varied, and my advice is always follow what interests you. Um, space science, a lot of people think it's it's astronomy or maybe it's a bit of geology and physics. Um, and a lot of what I do is I uh, on the surface geology and astronomy and geophysics, a little bit of geochemistry. Um, but I also I'm an artist. I use a lot of artistic sense and design, um, not just in communicating my work, but also in doing the types of things that I'm going to show you, um, including visualization. Um, a lot of working on missions is teamwork. It's understanding how systems work. It's getting an idea of how engineering works. If you're not an engineer, um, there's loads of different uh, engineering pathways into uh, doing space computing. Um, and I have a lot of friends who are sociologists, anthropologists, historians who study space, who study the history of space exploration, how mission teams work all sorts of different aspects. So I just wanted to emphasize that if you're interested in space, you don't have to be anything in particular. I think you just have to be interested and find your way. Um, and as a geologist, it's a, an ever expanding field and it's a really exciting time to uh, get into planetary science. Um, so if you're a geologist at any point in your career and you're interested in space, I would say go for it and um, reach out to people and also remember, uh, do what you love first. Um, so I'm going to start with just a simple graph. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about Mars today, but not completely. Um, but uh, Mars is really intriguing to us as scientists for a lot of reasons. Um, it's really similar to Earth, and you might not think that. Um, it's it's quite hostile. It's it's tiny, and um, there is a very thin atmosphere. It doesn't have tectonic plates. But what it does have on the surface are a lot of features that resemble things that we have on our planet from uh, volcanoes, which I show on the left, um, to uh, mineralogical veins, which I show in the middle. Um, and both of these things sort of paint this complex history of Martian, his of Martian geology, where um, explosive volcanism is something that we see in the solar system in a lot of places. But um, these minerals that are deposited, uh, presumably by water, are not something that we um, see, for example, on the moon. And that's really exciting to us. Um, there are a lot of uh, different, I'm gonna show you a lot of different types of features that um, show a complex history of water on Mars. But what we're sort of missing in a lot of ways is that um, water rock interactions that would support life. So I show on the right, um, a black smoker at the, the bottom of Earth's ocean. Um, and this is a place of a lot of heat and energy exchange and chemistry that uh, that supports um, microorganisms, which then support a broader ecosystem. 
Um, and so for the question of Mars, when we think about water, we have to think about was it there long enough to support evolution? And also was it interacting with the right types of geology to support the uh, microbiology that we understand on our planet? Um, so geology is sort of this bigger picture or is part of this bigger picture of life in the solar system, which is pretty cool. Um, and as geologists, you've heard a lot from a lot of geologists today, so I won't, I won't dwell too much on this, but there are a lot of ways of doing geology, right? You can go out in the fields, you can study uh, minerals under the microscope, um, you can go out and study glaciers in person and go diving and take measurements and do experiments in the field or back in a lab. Um, and that's a lot of what the core of geology has been. Um, and a lot of it is this field work, right? We've heard about field work today of going to places, measuring things, observing things in a qualitative way, uh, taking quantitative measurements, um, doing experiments out in the field or with samples. And all of that information goes into this bigger story of, of what I call it, um, of our planet or a region on our planet. And that's, that's kind of a cool way of thinking of geology. So I have this picture here. Um, you see people with maps and they're looking at an outcrop and that's kind of the context for Mars and what we're trying to do with Mars. It's that um, really in-depth sort of 3D look using um, different types of tools to build up on this right-hand side a uh, stratigraphic column, which shows basically going back in time, um, what were the environments that were influencing the geology that we're seeing in these outcrops. Um, of course, we can't send geologists to Mars yet. Um, so we have to rely on robotics. Um, so here, here are two pictures. I, I didn't have a picture of uh, Rosalind Franklin. Um, there's Curiosity rover on the right and Perseverance, sorry, on the left and Perseverance on the right. Um, these are basically the best sort of little robotic geologists that we can send these days. Um, so they have cameras like our eyes um, so they can view in 3D and I'll get to that in a bit. Um, they can move around, which is actually really important. They can take samples. They can sort of taste the samples in a way. They can tell us about the chemistry of those samples, um, do all sorts of other types of experiments. And this is kind of our next, next best thing besides taking a geologist to Mars or a few geologists, hopefully. Um, and so here's, here's just a look at Curiosity of what Curiosity can do. You can see a lot of instruments on um, the body of Curiosity. It's a very dusty camera on the mast. Um, and there are a lot of different instruments, including uh, lasers. There are different types of cameras. So we can look at geochemistry and mineralogy, and um, we can actually study the dust on the, the wheels um, to understand the mechanics of what we're driving over. Um, so it's kind of the best thing that we can do right now. Um, and here's an example of a more um, an image taken from a camera that studies mineralogy of looking at an outcrop. So this is kind of like, uh, we see when we go to an outcrop, right? We see, um, we look at outcrops from the ground, looking out to the horizon and, and get to look at them. Um, Curiosity gets to use special cameras to do that. So bright areas um, here might represent different minerals. I, th I don't I actually don't know this outcrop, but um, so that's what Curiosity can do and a lot of other rovers. Um, the thing is, well, we've had a lot of rovers and landers on Mars. Uh, this is a map from Emily Lakdawalla showing that. Um, the problem is a lot of these sort of targeted geologists are studying very, very local places. Um, a rover might not drive all that far. Um, so they're looking at the geological story, but in a very local setting. Um, the question is how do we sort of fill in the gaps between these very, very local, very detailed uh, understandings of places? And one answer is using satellite imagery. Um, so satellites are kind of like the second best geologists, right? They're the geologists flying in space. Um, and uh, so we have a lot of satellites going around Earth, of course, um, from which we get GPS and weather and whatnot. So here's an animation of Landsat, which provides a lot of um, Earth remote sensing. And uh, the images that we get back from that are these beautiful maps of the planet. Um, so it's not quite the same as sending a rover out or being a person out in the fields because you're looking down, you're looking in 2D. Um, but we're able to do this, not just at Earth, but also I have a little picture here of a crater. This is on Mars using um, the highest, resolu highest resolution camera we currently have orbiting Mars, which is called high rise And this is about 25 centimeters per pixel, which is 
much better than a lot of Earth imagery we get. And then the bottom here is a picture of a really interesting region on Jupiter's moon Europa, um, which I won't be talking about today, but which I study for my postdoc at JPL. Um, so we have a fleet of satellites out in the solar system, quite a lot at Mars um, that have these cameras that have different types of sensors that can uh, study gravity, uh, magnetic fields, particles, maybe even taste some particles as well. Um, so these are almost rovers that we can send into space and kind of can get a more regional to global view. But again, they're, they're sort of a, uh, they're limited in that they give us from imagery, um, typically a, a 2D map view. Um, so 3D is kind of a way, finding a way to take those images and view them, process them and view them in 3D is a way to make it a little more intuitive for people like me, a geologist, to understand. So here's a really beautiful picture. This is actually a 3D rendering I've done of the Curiosity rover landing site. And this is from orbital data. So Curiosity rover is a spec somewhere here. Um, and this is from more regional data. Um, that's about 170 kilometers across. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little more about this data. Um, but first I'll start off with um, how 3D works. And I think it's not trivial. Um, our, our brains receive 3D information in multiple ways. Um, we have two eyes, those for us who don't rely on sight, we have two ears, of course. Um, and the reason we have two of them is because uh, you can think of it as sensors that we have. And if we have two of them, there's a distance between them. And that separation is really important. Um, so that separation is the first input. And the second input is our brains. Our brains understanding of how uh, lighting works, of how shadows work, of um, the time of day, the direction of light, um, how different materials interact with light. So if we look at something reflective, our brains now get confused. It's a really smart, um, sort of passive processing happening in our brains that we don't have to think about, which is kind of amazing. Uh, the problem is computers aren't as smart as us. Um, so how do we process images in 3D? Well, it's kind of the same principle. Um, we need, generally, we need two images of the same area, but we need that space between them. So that means looking at it at different angles. Um, so I have a picture on the right, a little uh, animated GIF of um, two images uh, alternating back and forth. And these are images taken from that really high resolution camera I mentioned at Mars. Um, and they took them at different orbits. It took, it, it took these images at different orbits, which means that the viewing angle is different. Um, and uh, so we have those two images, they're at different angles. And if you sort of look at this animation long enough, you sort of get this sense of 3D structure, right? Our brains are understanding that. Um, the, the trouble is getting a computer to understand that. And luckily we live in an age of, of computing. And um, so there are a lot of computer programs that can take those two images, can take that information of the lighting, uh, the um, altitude above the surface, uh, all sorts of other parameters from where the camera is physically in space and the lighting conditions, and then do the things that our brain does, which is take those two images, take our understanding of the world and fuse them into a 3D understanding of depth. Um, so I'm going to, I'm not going to talk too much about how that processing is done, but that, that is something that I focus on. Um, so if we take the rover data, all of the measurements, chemistry, the imagery um, represented up here in the upper right, we combine that with 2D and 3D processed satellite imagery, um, we can actually get a better understanding, enhance that geological story that we're telling. We get the very hyperlocal, whatever the rover is seeing over the course of its traverse, but we're also getting the region, which gives us a lot of context to what it's seeing, can anticipate what it'll measure in the future and help us do planning, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so during my PhD, I won't talk about this too much, but I've used, uh, I've processed 3D imagery for multiple cameras at different resolutions, which shows, which is just represented by this diagram. Um, so uh, this is the landing site of Curiosity rover called Gale Crater. Um, and I started with the lowest resolution and went all the way up to the highest resolution uh, to visualize this tiny little strip. And it seems tiny, it's actually quite big. Um, and I'm gonna talk about why I selected that site and I'm gonna show it to you in 3D. Um, and actually, I'll show it to you now in 3D. Um, so this is Gale Crater. This is a nice map view 
Um, there's a lot of information we can get from maps. I, I don't want to write off maps as geologists. Um, so there's a lot to see in this image, um, this uh, false color, color image of a lot of different features, but we're going to take an exploration of them in 3D. I'm just going to narrate that to you. Um, so this scale crater, it's about 170 kilometers in diameter. Um, we're seeing a lot of different features. There's this topographic high in the center. This is called Aeolus Mons, or nicknamed Mount Sharp. We don't really know how it formed, if it's for, built up from sediments, if it's tectonic activity, if it's something completely different. Not really entirely sure, and that's kind of the mystery of Gale Crater. It sits on top of this big central mound that's this uh, topographic high in the center um, that sports a lot of different features that I'm going to show you in a moment. Here we go. And there are these beautiful lobate features to the north that show some sort of fluid flow, maybe some fluidized flow down slope that sort of look like maybe glaciers, probably not. Um, there are, there's evidence of uh, river activity, so this is Fara Vallis, which drains into the crater from uh, the crater rim, but is now dried up. Um, here's Sakaria Vallis, which I'll talk about further, um, which cuts through the central mound and shows some really spectacular uh, layering, which I'll show in more detail in a moment. Um, and here's an overview of the Curiosity Rover Traverse through August 2020. Uh, 2020. Um, so the white line is showing at the traverse so far. It's going up the slope of the central mound toward Mount Sharp, and it's cutting through a lot of this complex, really interesting geology. Um, so this is a way we can use 3D to look at a range of geological features away from the rover, and also take a look at where the rover is going, where the rover has been, and um, understand uh, some of the more targeted uh, investigation that it's done at the surface. Um, and so here's just a little view. Of so we have, we have the 3D imagery. We also have, um, I won't talk about it more, but we have multispectral imagery, which can tell us about um, mineralogy. And so these different colors are representing um, different sort of units that have been identified by the Curiosity Rover team as the traverse is ascending uh, Mount Sharp. Um, so we can use it for geology. I've talked about that um, and overviewing the traverse. Um, we can use this these images is to localize the rover, figure out where it is, where it's going, check out for hazards, check out um, potential interesting science targets. So I'm going to show you this, this view. I believe it's from April last year of uh, Curiosity ascended a, a cliff and was captured by this high resolution camera in space. Um, so in the bottom right, it's showing its view looking out that way um, off the cliff. And we're, we'll just take a little look at at that cliff. I've done this animation. This, this is false color. It's just to emphasize uh, differences in mineralogy, um, but it's mostly reddish brown. Um, so that's pretty cool. So we can use these uh, 3D images, especially visualized, to do quite a lot. Um, so for example, we can take a look at, you know, Curiosity is somewhere, ooh, somewhere down here. Um, and it's ascending this way. And we can take a look ahead, think about, OK, how can we plan a traverse to avoid certain hazards and slopes that are difficult for the wheels, but also figure out interesting science targets, interesting layers we might want to observe with the um, really cool instruments that are on board the rover. Um, so yeah, so you can see some of this, this geology rapidly changing upslope of this uh, big canyon. Um, so I'm going to tell the, the story of Curiosity Rover's uh, landing site, which is uh, Gale Crater, as I mentioned. This is an animation from JPL. Um, and it, I'm just going to give you a little narration. So it's an impact crater, big impact, made a crater. <clears throat> you have all these fractures under the ground. You see them filling up with blue. That's groundwater. So essentially, the rock was fractured, and there was some groundwater that is filling that up. <clears throat> that starts to fill up the crater a little bit, but we also get uh, regional flooding that is filling this crater because it's uh, topographically low. Uh, we get this, these nice lake sediments that are building up over time. Um, and we can see at the bottom of the crater right now, there's still that uh, groundwater that you can see in the cracks. Um, and slowly the flooding starts to dry up. And then at some point, there's all the sediment that's deposited, maybe that's filling the crater over time. Uh, very, very dry, arid period, probably lots of dunes and uh, wind-driven processes. Um, and over time, that will get eroded away uh, by some process or another, probably wind. Um, but that groundwater is still there. It's protected from radiation. Um, even as all of this material is eroding, this groundwater might be infilling um, the rocks underneath the surface. So you can sort of see that. And then eventually that stopped. 
Um, and nowadays we have Curiosity rover on the surface. Um, so that time scale was not to scale, you know, it's over billions of years. Um, so the question is, uh, so Curiosity rover, this is just a representation, but has explored a lot of these lake sediments, a lot of these dunes, um, showing a lot of periods of wet and dry, and uh, more recently has shown groundwater that has remineralized uh, lake sediments. So you see um, things like hematite uh, amongst clays. And that fills out the little stratigraphic column here of um, you know, what we can call the geologist story. We don't really know what's going on up here. And a lot of this is what Curiosity will be exploring in the next year. It won't get up all the way to the peak of Mount Sharp, but it'll get, uh, it'll get further up. It'll get up to this transition that we see in orbital images. Um, so this is kind of the question of my PhD of what's going on up here. Um, and one way you can do that, I mentioned Sakaria Vallis, which cuts through the central mound. This is about 30 kilometers away from where Curiosity rover is right now. And what's really interesting is that we see a lot of exposed layering. Um, so I'm just going to show you this. This is the data set that I use visualized in 3D um, using a visualization suite. You see these uh, uh, in just incredible layers. Um, this this feature is about two kilometers wide, about 400 meters deep, and about 15 kilometers long, not just in this image. Um, there are these bright features on the floor that are probably fluid flow from, from landslides. Uh, there are these enormous cliffs um, showing that certain units seem to be more resistant to erosion. There is this um, potentially cyclic material, meaning uh, we see these sort of repeated patterns that may represent repeated events or a persisting, for example, lake environment. Um, it's sort of hard to tell. It's in, it's in black and white. We don't have a lot of additional data. It's not quite the same as looking at it with a rover, but there's a lot we can do here, um, and it's really fantastic to look at, too. Um, so. And so if we study those layers, and that's that's what I'll be presenting um, from that stratigraphy, what we call it, um, if we compare all the relationships between the units, the beds that we see, um, their geometries, the relationships to each other, their thicknesses, their orientations, um, and how they relate to each other, how they change, um, not just at that site, but throughout the mound, uh, compared with what the rover sees, compared with what we can see in 3D or orbital data from other places in the crater, we can sort of build up a model of what the layering looks like in the subsurface. And that can be compared with models of deposition and erosion to sort of figure out um, where this mound came from, how it evolved, and what's the story with water as well, including did water actually persist long enough um, to support uh, evolution or prebiotic pre conditions, or was it sort of a punctuated, uh, you know, rainy season and then dry for thousands of years and rainy season, et cetera, which is sort of the question of Mars as a whole right now. Um, so I showed you my data that was in a different software suite, um, but I use a piece of software that's been developed to study 3D images from rovers, which I didn't talk about today, but, but which are very, very cool. Um, so this is a program developed for uh, Rosalind Franklin and also Perseverance um, to basically take these 3D images wherever they're from and look at them as if we're a geologist on the surface, not just looking around, but also being able to take measurements, um, sketch things out, take notes, uh, correlate things, um, understand the topography of an outcrop. It's not quite the same as taking your compass and whatever experimental um, uh, equipment that you have out to an outcrop and spending a week there and doing your, doing your mapping and detailed stratigraphy. That's kind of the next best thing. We can't send anyone there, right? Um, so with orbital images, you can do the same thing. Um, so this is an example, this is very old. My work doesn't actually look like this, but it's not published, so I won't share that. Um, Showing, showing that type of workflow. Um, so you could just play around with this terrain. It's really amazing just because like this is this is huge. You have a one kilometer marker up there um, showing you how big this place is. Um, but you can get this very, very detailed analysis, um, which is what I've done with my PhD of trying to do, trying to understand these places as outcrops. Um, the only problem is we are, again, it's black and white. Our eyes don't really understand uh, this geology in black and white. There's a lot of information that's missing. So there's certain things that we can't comment on or observe, certain things like texture. Um, we can see down to a confidence level of about 
I would say a meter uh, for boulders um, and such. And um, so there's like really, really, really coarse texture. You can see the images here, the image overlying the 3D terrain is 25 centimeters, um, but you have to be very careful with how you describe it. So again, it's not exactly the same, but there are a lot of um, uh, interesting things that you can do. And this technique is gonna expand in future as we get more and more 3D data, um, which is exciting. So um, here's a little summary from, from my thesis. Um, so in the bottom left is the 2D map view, where I've mapped out the units that I've identified. In the upper left is the 3D perspective view, where I've overlaid those interpretations. Um, and then here's just an animation of me building up that stratigraphic story, that column, um, from the base units all the way up to the top and describing them. I've called them packages um, just because we can't really quite say units um, without having all the information from orbital data. Um, so this is something really cool. I've done this throughout the entire canyon or most of the canyon at, multi at uh, 11 different spots. Um, so you can see that um, uh, this isn't quite to scale and the orientations are not, are not accurate here. They're not horizontal at all. Um, but this is what we can do with this, this type of data of start to build up that stratigraphic story that we're getting from a rover in, in great detail. The types of stories that we can tell when we go out in the field and sketch out a column knowing uh, what's going on in our map and also what's in front of us uh, or along um, a field exploration. Um, so it's not, again, it's not quite the same as what we do here on Earth, but it's, it's approaching there and it's filling in a lot of details for us. And so this is representing about um, a kilometer of stratigraphy um, in a section that's above where the rover is currently. So I'm gonna show you, um, so again, this is about, I wanna say August, 2020. So this isn't completely updated. It's kind of a little further than this. Um, so here's a look in the future of where it's gonna go. It's traveling up here and you see a lot of this layering that looks quite similar to the channel. So based on my map, a lot of these units are actually the same um, starting around here. So hopefully Curiosity is currently actually seeing some of these units in the distance, out, in the distant outcrops in its images. Um, which is really exciting. Um, so this will start to fill in the actual details of this uh, coarser look at the stratigraphy. While the coarser look at the stratigraphy may help with regional con uh, context for what the rover reconstructs from what it sees. Um, so I just wanna show you a lot of cool videos basically. Um, I, wanna, I wanna walk through, I've showed you Gale Crater on Mars. There are a lot of uh, different types of features on, on Mars that 3D imagery can illuminate. Um, so here is the landing site for Perseverance Rover. I made this video before we knew where it was landing. It's landing around here, I believe. Um, but I've dropped in a simulated uh, rover model. And this is something that we can do to look at things like scale, um, hazards, uh, plan out traverse um, ahead of time which gives us a lot of information. It gives us a lot of power when we're thinking about um, how to plan a rover mission. Um, so there are these beautiful and enormous uh, delta deposits. You can see how tiny this little rover is in comparison. Um, and this is false color. All of these are false color. Um, here's uh, one location of the Opportunity rover. This is probably 2004. Um, Opportunity ceased uh, operations only a couple of years ago. Um, and this is pretty cool. This is a place called Victoria Crater um, and it's being shown in black and white. Um, so uh, Opportunity drove around this crater, studied all the cool outcrops, it was likely very dry processes. Um, it's also really cool because again, we were able to see the rover on the surface. So you see this little fat image, that's the rover looking over the cliff, which is quite amazing. So you get an idea of scale of our little geologists compared to what they're looking at. Um, And here is, this is a video that I've made recently of some ancient gullies on Mars. This is a crater rim um, and down slope, we see these features that we, we see on, on Earth of, um, of gullies that have been shaped potentially by water in the past and also wind erosion. Um, and you can see their 3D structure, which is really, really cool. You can see these really enormous boulders that are probably meters across that have, um, and, and these flows have etched these 3D 
uh, gullies into the rim of this crater, which is pretty amazing. Um, so if you take a closer look, you get these polygonal structures as well. So we're getting a, a very complex uh, look at the geology from just the 2D imagery, but then the 3D can give us information about uh, thicknesses and um, channel widths and all sorts of other geometric uh, information. And it's also a lot more intuitive for a geologist to play around with to look at in comparison to Earth in what we um, might call comparative planetology of, of looking at similar processes across different planets. You can see a little delta that's gone. Um, so it's quite amazing. Um, so we'll take a look. This is another interesting one. Again, this is this isn't real color. Um, this is a scarp on Mars, um, and what we see here in sort of yellows are is probably like basaltic. Um, what we see here in blues and a bit of browns are probably ice deposits. So this is inside of a crater. There's some sort of structural motion that's ex exposed the scarp. And in the subsurface, we have icy sediment, basically. Um, and this is really exciting. There seems to be a large reservoir of subsurface ice, um, not just at cold places on Mars, but also in the mid-latitudes where it's warmer. Um, and this has been really exciting for things like astrobiology, where we know, say, for example, uh, under ice sheets, we see bacteria. We might see, um, especially like a stream of what we call extremophiles, archaeobacteria that can survive in these conditions. So if there is subsurface ice on Mars, that kind of brings up a bit of hope. Even if we don't see these things on the surface, that perhaps there's evidence of past life in the subsurface. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, again, not real, not real color. Um, this is a terrace crater on Mars. You see these really incredible 3D structures around this crater that likely represents um, very different types of layering after the impact. So it didn't impact uniformly. Um, and that may mean ice under the surface may just mean um, radically different compositions. Here's just a, an enormous dune field around this area, uh, which is quite amazing. So you can see all these specks. Those are dunes shaped by wind. Um, a lot of the dunes that we see, these are probably active dunes, um, but we also see fossilized dunes as well. Um, you can get heights of these dunes from 3D data. Um, you can model wind flows over time. Um, it's quite spectacular. And here's some, some complex regional geology around here as well, some sort of channelized flow. Um, so I talked about Mars a lot. And Mars is not the only cool place in the solar system. Um, as we're getting more and more missions to the outer solar system, hopefully, uh, or just in other places in the solar system, we're going to get more 3D imagery. And whether that's from dedicated cameras that give us 3D images or people processing images into 3D, we're getting more high resolution data that we can use to understand these surfaces in these ways. Um, so the New Horizons a spacecraft, which uh, flew by Mars about six years ago, um, gave us some just incredible imagery. And so this is stitched together into a global view um, by the USGS, and I've visualized it here. Um, and I'm just going to talk through some of the like kind of wacky things we see on Pluto. Um, so right here in the middle is, I believe it's Tombaugh Regio. Um, so this is a really smooth area. We don't normally see smooth areas in the solar system when there's no atmosphere. And uh, models suggest that this is about 10 million years old, which means there's some sort of active process that has resurfaced this area in the past 10 million years. See these impact craters? <clears throat> this is false color, um, so don't take anything from the light and the dark here. Um, but we see this transition from sort of highlands into what are likely nitrogen glaciers. It's cold enough that nitrogen is ice and flows, um, probably nitrogen icebergs and mountains as well. Um, so again, here are the highlands, they're shown to be like sort of broken up, there's smooth areas around here that might show tectonic motion being driven by the subsurface. Who knows if it's a subsurface ocean maybe? How does an ocean stay uh, cold out here? It probably has some sort of antifreeze like ammonia. Um, you, this may be evidence, all of these sort of lines may be evidence of that of <coughs> convection cells where you get rising and falling of material in that ocean. You also see dunes, which I don't know if you can see at this resolution, but very, very fine sort of etching on here of dunes. 
Um, so when we flew by Pluto, which was supposed to be just this dead little world, we saw something that was quite dynamic, um, very changing. And that's really exciting. Um, we're thinking about subsurface water or mixed water oceans way, way, way out in our solar system, which is rapidly changing our understanding of our cosmic neighborhood. Um, this is a little, little fun animation I did. Um, this was a uh, project that uh, UCL did with JPL on um, potential landing sites for astronauts in the Artemis program, which is the upcoming uh, moon landing program from NASA. Um, so one of the potential landing sites is a place called Aristarchus uh, Crater. Um, and this is really useful. 3D is especially useful for landing people because we have to think about hazards. We have to think about, can someone walk on the surface? Is there interesting geology or will it sort of waste our time? Um, and the moon is uh, quite different from somewhere like Mars. It's not really Earth-like, so we have to be very careful. So this is a little animation I did. I've superimposed the Earth in the background, so you're going to see it rise. Um, so this might be a very uh, distant view of what astronauts might see on the moon in the future. This is the rim of the crater, um, which is quite amazing. And last, I wanted to finish on a visualization from the Earth, because I'd be remiss to not mention that um, Earth is a planet in the solar system. And 3D is really, really important for what we do. Uh, as geologists, um, we use not just satellite images, but especially drone, drone imagery and also drone LIDAR, which is a laser altimetry where you have an instrument that sends a laser pulse to the surface and measures the time it takes to return. And that gives you a really high fidelity, high fidelity 3D map onto which you can drape images. Um, and this can help us study remote areas, including uh, monitoring hazards such as um, earthquakes and um, things like landslides, mudslides, that sort of thing, uh, monitor uh, glaciers um, to keep track of, of ice budgets on the planet, which is important to climate change, things like that. Um, so a lot of the 3D work we're doing as geologists, the most important stuff is the, what we're doing on Earth. Um, so I just want to show you this animation I did. This is a LIDAR generated 3D terrain of this just really beautiful area in Utah um, called Rapley Ridge. So you can see where water has sculpted this ridge and these just incredibly beautiful painted hills. Um, so these are sequences of sandstone, limestone, and mudstone that erosion has sort of shaped into these, into these V shapes that is just quite spectacular. That's a road for scale. Um, and it's just amazing to see. Um, you know, there are resemblances to gullies on Mars. There are resemblances to a lot of things that we see on Mars that's sculpt but sculpted by water and air. Um, but what's so special about our planet is that we have life so embedded in our geology. Um, it's really a special place that, that we get to see this diverse geology in person, that we're alive here today, and we can go measure rocks and, and enjoy our planet. Um, that's very special. So I just wanted to end on that um, because I think this is, this is more important than my work. <laughs> so um, I think we have extra time. So I have extra couple of slides. Um, here's, here's one last animation. This is the fav my favorite animation that I've ever done. This is Sakaria Vallis. This is my study site. Um, and I've dropped a little model of an astronaut who's about uh, six feet, um, pretending it's me and pretending I'm much taller than I am, um, looking out over the cliffs of uh, Sakaria Vallis, which again is about 400 meters tall. It's easy to think that when, when we work with these images that we're working with small areas, but when you put it into human terms, it's absolutely incredible. Um, and I really wanted to highlight that with this video that's just showing this astronaut, we're gonna zoom away and just sort of give you some context of how small this person is. Um, and I like to think that this is sort of moving towards that, uh, what we call the overview effect that we get when um, astronauts go to space, they see the earth and they, understand not only how fragile and precious it is, but also how small we are um, and also how influential we are on the planet. We heard about climate today and that's really important. Um, and I think in space, again, it's easy to forget the scale of things. It's also easy to forget about our own planet, how special it is. Um, and I think I try to humble myself with, my, with 3D images where 
you see these familiar cliffs, it looks like the Grand Canyon or somewhere familiar. It looks like somewhere you might see in your backyard or driving up in the north and, and um, into Scotland, right, of uh, these great hills. Um, but it's, it's hostile. It's, you can't live there. You can't land in Ashra here. It's actually incredibly dangerous. Um, and so these are our proxies for getting to those places of getting that sense of overview effect, not just about Mars, but also about ourselves and how, uh, how special our planet is. Um, so this is the original image that sort of sparked the idea of the overview effect. It's Earthrise um, from Apollo 8 in 1968 of this image of the whole planet. And um, this is during the civil rights movement in, in the West and um, sort of sparked an environmental movement as well in the 60s and 70s of looking at how fragile and precious our world is that we're all on together, um, which was amazing. And so I'm really interested in, I do a lot of um, work with social scientists. I do a lot of speaking about this of um, not just making space about everyone, but also making sure that we're making um, space in space for everyone, that we're making sure that the conversation involves everyone because everyone deserves this type of feeling of um, appreciating our planet and um, feeling safe on our planet as well. Um, and so sort of context for that is uh, there's a lot of conversation of, of our space activities here on, on Earth of, you know, we can look at all these beautiful images and data, but what are we doing here on Earth um, to other human beings to get the data? So for example, um, the 30 meter telescope is a planned project uh, in Hawaii on um, sacred land. And so this has been protested for years and years. Um, so it's sort of this bigger question of sort of who gets to look at these images and who gets to like, um, enjoy them and understand, uh, not understand them, but uh, um, appreciate them from just the sort of blank point of view of, of um, enjoying space as the place that we all belong to, who doesn't have access to that data, who's taken advantage to get space data, that type of thing. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because that's a big core of, of what I do sort of outside of work. I do a lot of things like advocacy. I, I run a conference about these types of issues. Um, and because space space does belong to all of us. So let's make sure that we all have access to it. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to our hosts. Um, and thank you to JPL and UCL for, uh, for letting me do this really cool work. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you, Divya. That was definitely eye-opening. And I mean, who knows? Maybe we'll get to do field trips on Mars uh, someday. <laughs> But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Yeah, we do have one um, from Meg Davies. She says, you mentioned that the packages aren't horizontal. Is it possible to use a stratigraphic idea to add to the picture of the evolution of tectonic regimes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't get into that at all, uh, partly because I'm trying to submit my thesis soon. Um, so part of, part of the work I've done in this software is collect uh, dips and strikes from, from all of the, the packages, including um, like sub packages within these packages towards building up a, a bit of a local model of what's going on, um, possibly tectonically. Um, so that kind of goes into comparing with existing models of uh, regional tectonics and that sort of thing. So it could be, um, it could be as simple as like local uplift or it could be some sort of subsidence. I don't really know, um, this, is, this is quite recent recent results, um, but it is very interesting. And a lot of a lot of the layering on the central mound does sort of dip outwards along the slopes. So um, it sort of supports this idea that it's probably just sediment that's been built up. That's sort of, um, if you look at a, a huge slope on the edges, you're gonna get that sort of steep dipping. Um, and this sort of complicates that, but we're not really sure. We have to look at look at all sorts of things like error, but that, that is part of the, the bigger work and, and future work. Um, so thank you for your question. We've also got another question from Leonardo Yida. Uh, beautiful talk, Divya. For the generating the 3D models, do you need precise positioning of the satellite and ground features? If so, how is that attained somewhere like Mars? And awesome that acknowledge the conflicts in Hawaii. Yeah, thanks for your question. Yeah, so precise Precise positioning is um, absolutely necessary. There's a whole system that um, that different space agencies uh, use to basically encode data that we get back from satellites with the the time, the angle of the sun, the altitude, viewing angles, all sorts of other things. 
um, and precise positioning sort of in the solar system. Um, and that's all encoded in a type of file called, called SPICE. Um, so all of that information has to go into these processing suites and they tend to draw from uh, um, a lot of different, uh, I'm not in computing, but a lot of different types of other suites that can understand that information and sort of back calculate those things. For understanding positioning ground features, that's almost a different issue and very complicated and part of part of the work that I've done. Um, but we do have some some level of ground truth because we have global LIDAR coverage. So for especially lower resolution images, we can tie that down to that 3D data and trust that that's probably correct. Um, and then with higher resolution data, we can start aligning it to that lower resolution data. So it, it's quite complex. Um, but we do luckily at Mars have that ground truth. Elsewhere in the solar system, we're not so lucky. So it is very difficult to do imaging of basically anywhere besides the moon or Mars um, and know where something is down to like a meter, right? Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got another question, Christopher Gilsenden. Uh, can we use the Earth as a dialogue for explaining Mars directly or are there many uh, limitations to this? That's a great question, yeah. Um, so a lot of Mars geology is field work on Earth. Um, there are a lot of features on Mars that have led to uh, field work on, um, for example, glaciers uh, in extreme environment, you know, Ar the Arctic desert environments. Um, there's a feature on Mars called, well, inverted channels where you get a, a river, um, it's flowing, it has maybe sediment in it, and then over time it dries up. and um, the sediment is more resistant to erosion than the area around it. So you get sort of uh, a reverse topography of these channels. And we only see that on Earth and Mars. So that's a big place, a uh, big site in Utah uh, for, I believe it's Utah, um, for field work. So there is a lot of that. There's a lot of also in astrobiology of looking at extremophiles or bacteria that live in like volcanic or um, icy volcanic environments to understand um, how they function, how they metabolize different uh, chemicals from rocks. So a lot of actually like earth geology has come out or earth um, geochemistry and geobiology has come out of Mars research into those environments. So it's, it's actually really, really important. Um, yeah, thanks. We've got another question from Matthew Bell. Would there be a way of generating and using seismic data on Mars and other planets to look at the internal structures under places such as Gale Crater? That's really, yeah, that's really cool. Um, there is a mission at Mars called InSight, um, which landed, I want to say, four years ago now. Um, that is a seismometer. Um, so that is not, not anywhere close to Gale Crater, unfortunately, um, but that is able to study the subsurface and the deep uh, internal structure of Mars. Um, it's my understanding that that would be too coarse to look at somewhere as, as uh, locally constrained as Gale Crater, but it would be something that can um, at least give us a lot of insight into the tectonic evolution of Gale, of uh, Mars and also Mars quakes, which seem to be happening a lot actually, um, which is really cool. So. Um, yeah, stay tuned. I think there are a lot of upcoming results coming from from Insight, and that's also worth a, worth a Google. It's just it's just a really cool mission. Um, as regards to other places, um, that's the only place we have a I believe it's the only place we have a seismometer, certainly of that sensitivity. Um, I work on a concept called Europa Lander, uh, which, if funded, um, will land on Europa, as the name suggests, and that will also have a seismometer. So that will. That's a planet that probably has a subsurface ocean that will give us a lot of information of what's going on inside there, which is really exciting. So cross your fingers. Nice. Europa, that's a planet on Jupiter, is it? Whereas, that, yeah, that's, a, that's um, one of the four large moons of Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, Chris has also got another question. What hopes do you have for future research in this area, Jim? Uh, future research, oh, anything. <laughs> just more more data from other places i think um i love mars i just um to get that level of data from anywhere else besides the moon would be just amazing so i'm really excited for future missions to venus um i know nasa has funded a, a couple of missions that are coming up um i think europe is interested if not has funded um mission um i'm interested in what's going on with the moons of Uranus and Neptune after seeing what was what's happening with Pluto, what can happen really in the outer solar system with like 
oceans and atmosphere um, that we just don't expect out there. It's just it's just so strange and exotic, and I love that. Um, so I think hopes is that I hope that we get as much data as possible in my lifetime, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah, that sounds cool. I've also got a question as well, just about mm -hmm. you looking at sedimentology in craters, it seems. There must be a cutoff point for that deposition, uh, maybe when water ran out or something. What sort of um, imprint does that make on the sedimentary sequence? Yeah, um, so it's sort of it's sort of a debate. Um, it's generally understood that water at Mars dried up probably, let me not mess up my numbers, I think 3.8 billion years ago. So pretty early on in Mars lifetime. Um, the question is like how much persisted after that, if it was subsurface ice that was protected from radiation, if it was indeed radiation that stripped the atmosphere and then stripped water. Um, so for stratigraphy, it is a bit difficult to correlate um, for example, curiosity, what it sees to a specific time. Um, we can do that with uh, cratering. We can look at sort of crater densities and sort of extract age from that, which is it's quite difficult. It involves a lot of modeling to get an exact age, but we can get relative age. Um, but for looking at sort of outcrops, it is, it is difficult. Um, so we need, um, Curiosity can sample, it can do some absolute dating, which is very, very cool. So. Um, I'm less versed in that, um, but I do know that they are applying absolute ages to certain layers and building that geography. Um, but I can't say that I know enough to answer your question with confidence, but I believe you know that's feeding into the model of water on Mars. Okay. Uh, yeah, we've got another question from uh, Matthew Bell. He asks, uh, is there any way to use radio waves, radio waves to look at the composition of planets from space? Yeah, radar is really important on space missions. Um, uh, radar is useful for a lot of things. Um, I would say less for composition and more for either mechanical properties of the surface, um, just because radio waves are so coarse, you don't really get too much information about composition, but you might get information about um, very coarsely like compaction, um, but also uh, ground penetrating radar is something that we can do from space. Um, so they're ground penetrating radars at uh, at Mars currently, at the moon, um, on a number of other missions. And so those can look into the subsurface at different lengths, uh, depths, depending on the mission, uh, which is really cool. So we can get some structure, we can get some stratigraphy even um, at certain scales. And, and that's been important. So at Mars that's revealed, um, reservoirs of water under the icy poles, which is really interesting and cool. I um, mean, can also, if we get higher resolution, can look at ice as well on the subsurface. So again, less less composition, but more into that, um, the subsurface structure of like the crust and the upper mantle, um, which is very cool. Yeah. 